chapter and we're going to turn now to Philippians and to the closing verses of chapter 3 and the opening verse of chapter 4. We've been looking at this great chapter for a number of weeks and we come to a conclusion this evening. Let's read from verse 20 of chapter 3 through to verse 1 of chapter 4. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and longed for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. Paul is contrasting here those whose teaching and whose living posed a serious threat, a serious danger to the church. And he's contrasting that with the example of himself and Epaphroditus and of Timothy. The people he's concerned about, he tells us, their God was their belly, they gloried in their shame, they minded earthly things, their end was destruction, and they were enemies of the cross. Avoid them. But then he says, I want you to imitate Timothy and Epaphroditus and myself, because we live for Christ, we live for the glory of Christ, we live under the cross of Christ, we seek to put to death the old nature, the sinful nature. We live in the shadow of earthly life, but in the reality of heavenly glory. So Christ came to make us a holy people, and that is how we are to be, and we are to be ready for eternity. That's what he's been saying. And now he gives two reasons, two great reasons for that. The first is because of who we are and where we are. Who are we? Well, we are citizens of heaven. Where are we? Well, we are already in heavenly places. Our citizenship is in heaven. Now, these Christians in Philippi were Roman citizens. They were part of the Roman Empire. And yet they lived in Philippi, which was a Roman colony, and they were under Roman authority. They were under the Roman law. They had privileges that belonged to people from Rome, and they had responsibilities likewise. So you would have expected that people from a Roman background with Roman citizenship would have not only enjoyed the privileges of that citizenship, but also accepted its responsibilities. Christians are like that. They live in a particular environment, in a particular state or particular country. They have a particular nationality, but their home is elsewhere. So we are at the same time as we are citizens, say of New Zealand or the United Kingdom or wherever, we are citizens of heaven, and we are to live as such. We are to live under the shadow of the cross. We are to live in the expectation of our Lord's return and under his authority. Citizens we are of an earthly kingdom. We've all got a passport, I take it, or an ID card. We are all on the civil list of our particular country. Our names are there. So we have certain obligations and responsibilities. If you're a New Zealand citizen, you have to obey the law. It's the same with those of us who come from the United Kingdom. We have to obey the law. We have certain privileges, but we have to also accept our responsibilities. And that means behaving as worthy citizens, as honorable people, as those who support the government and who support the state, and who are under the authority of our particular government. Well, Christians are like that, 
obviously, because we are still here on earth and we live in this earthly realm. But at the same time, we are citizens of heaven. That's where we really belong. Martin Luther used to speak about two kingdoms. The kingdom at God's left hand, which was the state, and the kingdom at God's right hand, which is the church or the kingdom of God. And we belong to both. We become citizens of the heavenly kingdom by new birth. When Jesus spoke to Nicodemus, that's what he said. You must be born from above, or you must be born again, you must be born anew. But the word is anothen, which means from above. You have a heavenly birth. You come to know God as your Father and Christ as your Savior because God has given you heavenly spiritual life in Christ. In the same way, our Lord spoke about our names being written in heaven. Written there from before the foundation of the world, says the Apostle Peter. So, we really belong here, but we also belong there. And when Peter writes in the opening chapter of his magnificent first letter, he puts that in almost lyrical terms. You may well be familiar with these words. They're among the most encouraging and wonderful words ever recorded in the scriptures. Paul is a wonderful example of a man who wrote lyrically about the, the eternal world, but so did Peter. Peter, he says, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles. That's what they were. Elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctifying work of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Your exiles, you're scattered throughout Asia Minor, you belong to the dispersion. But you really belong ultimately to heaven. And he then goes on to say, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who are being kept. So that's who we are. We're exiles here. This world is not our final home. It's wonderful to be here. We have responsibilities and privileges. But ultimately, our home is somewhere else. Our home is in heaven. So we are to live accordingly as citizens of heaven. Under the cross, under the Lordship of Christ. Set your mind on things above, Paul wrote where Christ is. And rejoice in him, says Paul here to these Philippian Christians. Our Lord spoke about Christians as salt and light. And you will remember that in those days, no refrigeration, meat was kept and preserved through salt being rubbed into it. So the salt was distinctive but it was very closely involved with the, the meat into which it was rubbed. And Christians are meant to be distinctive and yet involved in the world and its affairs. So we are to be salt, and that means that we are in the world here to preserve it from corruption. And then Jesus spoke about the Christian as light. You are the light of the world. And it's a dark world, as well as a corrupting world, as we know. So we are to shine as lights in the world. Actually, Paul here in this same letter speaks about that. Shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life. So we are representatives of Christ. We are his hands, if you like, and his feet. That's who we are. And that's where we are. We are citizens of heaven and already we have been raised up with Christ 
and we sit in heavenly places with Jesus Christ. Therefore, you ought to live in the right way, not as these people who are the enemies of the cross and who live for their passing pleasures. But then the second reason why we are to live like this is because of what and where we will be. They were citizens of the Roman Empire, but they lived in Philippi, so they were away from Rome. They were a colony of Rome in Philippi. Christians are, to, are citizens of heaven, but they remain on earth. We are here as a colony of heaven on earth. You remember how in the Bible there are two dimensions or planes of existence. If you like, two dimensions of reality. There's heaven and there's earth. In the book of Genesis, heaven and earth were one. There was no separation of the two. The voice of the Lord God was heard walking in the garden in the cool of the evening. God was everywhere. And the two planes of existence, the two dimensions of existence were one and the same. But the fall led to a separation of heaven and earth. So now God's dimension of present existence, God's plane of existence, if you like, is heaven. Our Father who art in heaven. Ours is the earth. But the day is coming when these two planes of existence, these two dimensions of reality, will become one again, so that heaven and earth will be one. It's a wonderful prospect. It does mean that wonderful as this world is, as this earth is, it's going to become more wonderful when the earth is finally filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. So we are citizens of heaven, but not there yet. And Paul tells us that from heaven, we eagerly wait for a savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. Now it's worth asking how much we think of the second coming of Christ. How real is that in our daily experience? I venture to say that in our modern world, it has faded into some kind of insignificance, even among professing Christians. We have become very, very earth-centered. But for the early church, the second coming of Christ was something imminent. It is still imminent. It always has been imminent. Because a thousand years is as a day, and a day is as a thousand years. We look forward to his coming again in glory. And when he comes, we are told, he will transform our lowly bodies. Because the Christian hope is the resurrection of the body. It is not the survival of the spirit without a body. It is the resurrection of the body. That's the Christian hope. And he will transform our lowly bodies. We will be gathered together with him in the glory of heaven and the glory of earth, which are now one. We shall be with him, we shall be like him. How much do we think about that? Sometimes we get caught up in theories, don't we, about the second coming, and dates and so on, and we have our plans and our schemes, so that we actually miss the reality of it, the wonder of it. So caught up are we in the details that we plan out very neatly in our schemes that we forget about the reality, the wonderful reality. Jesus is coming again. Listen to some very wise words of Augustine about the second coming. That day lies hid, that every day we may be on the watch. He who loves the coming of the Lord is not he who affirms that it is far off, nor is it he who says that it is near. 
but rather he who with whether it be far off or near awaits it with sincere faith steadfast hope and fervent love you couldn't put it better than that Jesus is coming again that is a glorious and great hope actually Paul here says we eagerly wait for his coming how are we doing that how are we eagerly waiting for the Lord's return Jesus spoke about watching and waiting and working he told us that there would be many people caught out they would not be ready the door would be shut they would be excluded he is coming back to earth and he's coming back to earth we're told here as the savior the one who is going to save the earth and the universe from sin and corruption and bring about a perfect universe and a perfect earth and a perfect world one day he is going to come to save it just as he saves our souls just as he will save our bodies so he will save the whole cosmos he is coming as the savior and he is our lord jesus christ paul gives him his full title here you remember that he came once incognito born of a woman under the law to redeem those who were under the law he humbled himself paul tells us he took the form of a servant though he was in the form of god and what that really means is that he really was in the form of god just as a sword made of steel is a real sword and is real steel but the steel is in the form of a sword so jesus is in the form of god he really is god but he took the form of a servant he humbled himself he became obedient to death even death on the cross and now he is highly exalted paul uses a word there that he actually created and invented it's not used anywhere else in the bible or anywhere else in greek he highly exalted him paul couldn't find the appropriate word to describe what is going to happen when jesus will be highly exalted over the cosmos over nature over the devils over the world and already he is in that supreme place and one day every knee will bow to him and every tongue will confess him believers willingly unbelievers unwillingly but unbelievers will submit to him will confess him to be lord even though they hate him but believers will do so gladly and joyfully and eagerly he is the one we eagerly wait for and then paul says he will transform our lowly bodies he will give us a new embodiment we have these bodies at the moment and uh, within them we all struggle a bit those of us who are getting a bit on in years struggle more than those perhaps who are younger in years but we all struggle in the body we all get tired we all find we have to go to sleep hopefully not in sermons <laughs> we get ill we know what hardship means we know what it is to get older as soon as a baby is born it starts to age But there's a glorious change going to take place the seed the body will become a plant the new body will be spiritual that doesn't mean it will be some kind of mystical airy fairy non-material body it means that it will be capable of expressing the new life of the holy spirit perfectly because in these bodies we can't we find it hard sometimes to express ourselves in prayer our minds are not as alert and active as one day they will be but one day when that new body is given to us the spiritual body we shall be able perfectly to praise god without any imperfection whatsoever in holy happy healthy bodies he is going to transform 
these lowly bodies, so that they will be like his glorious body. We shall reflect his glory as the moon reflects the sun. We shall always be human, never be divine, but we shall be living a life of freedom and joy without infirmity or aging or any such thing. Holy human, but now in the likeness of Jesus, our risen Lord. What will that heavenly realm be like, we ask? Well, I was here and Pam some years back when on the television they showed helicopters going around various parts of New Zealand and we had these wonderful vistas of this magnificent country and those snippets of video were accompanied by Louis Armstrong singing in his beautiful gravelly voice what a wonderful world I've never forgotten those what a wonderful world I wish I could I wish I could sing it like he did it's a wonderful world isn't it New Zealand is a wonderful place we had an invitation just recently from friends that we go over to Mississippi a bit and uh, he asked if we would be willing to go next year and I said well it all depends at the moment we're in New Zealand oh he said why didn't you take me with you <laughs> it is a wonderful place Wales is a beautiful place but there's a day coming when it will be made perfect there will be no nature red in tooth and claw there will be no dying and death, no corruption, no sickness, no disease, no loss, no bereavement, no heartache, no separation. Everything will be pure glory. That will be wonderful. It will be wonderful. It will be wonderful too to be free from all our imperfections both of mind and body with an imperishable immortal body that would be wonderful it'll be wonderful to be with the patriarchs with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and David and all the great prophets of old and the apostles of the New Testament be wonderful to be with them think of it it'll be wonderful to be with loved ones who've gone on before us who've been through that dark valley and have come out into the light and glory of the Saviour's presence It'd be wonderful to be with friends again whom we've known and loved but best of all unquestionably best of all is to be with Jesus himself to be with him you remember the old hymn, When all my labours and trials are o'er, And I am safe on that beautiful shore, Just to be near the dear Lord I adore, Will through the ages be glory for me. Oh, that will be glory for me. And it will. We may wonder, well, how can that be? If you stood at the grave of a loved one, or been to a cremation service, we ask, how can that possibly be? Well, Paul tells us how and gives us the answer. Who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself? The power of Christ. I mean, if God can create this universe out of nothing with a word, then how ridiculous it is to say that he can't resurrect a body. God is the one who has all power in himself as well as at his disposal. And it's effective power. It's all power. So everything will be brought under his control. He owns it all. 
he made it all. The forces of nature will be brought under his control. The universe will be brought under his control. Unbelieving cynics and skeptics will be brought under his control. Even the powers of darkness and evil will be brought under his control. His mighty power. We dare not and cannot minimize that. And it's that that is our confidence and our hope. Now you would have thought that Paul would have finished on that high note, wouldn't you? But he was always the practical theologian, always the practical pastor. So he draws a conclusion, as he did in 1 Corinthians 15. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. If this is true as it is, then stand firm in the Lord. Don't allow anybody to shift you. We're still on earth after all. We're still in the body. We're still surrounded by enemies. We're still battling with ourselves and with difficulties and with disputes. Stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. Paul is pouring out his pastoral heart here. Notice how affectionate he is. My brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, my beloved. This is Paul, the pastor, the one who loves his people. And he's just saying to them, stand firm. There are enemies aboard. Stand firm. There's a devil to fight. Stand firm. There are sins to conquer. Stand firm. There were actually two women in Philippi who were at loggerheads, Euodia and Syntyche. And Paul says, bring them together. Reconcile them. I beseech you, you oh dear, and I plead with you, Syntyche, to agree with each other in the Lord. And I ask you, loyal fellow worker, help these women who have contended by my side in the cause of the gospel along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers. They've quarreled, they're divided. Maybe they don't speak to each other. Bring them together. This is the implication of the resurrection. Because of who you are and where you are, because of who you will be and where you will be, this is the way to put it into practice, my dear, dear, beloved brothers. Because Paul here is speaking as one who knew what it was to have a sharp disagreement. He had a very sharp disagreement, so sharp, in fact, that he had to separate from his Beloved Barnabas, the son of consolation, the great encourager. Paul and Barnabas had a really sharp dispute over whether to take John Mark with them in their missionary travels. And Paul said no. Barnabas said yes. They couldn't agree. And so they went their separate ways, alas. But then, if you read the letter to the Colossians, you will discover that all of that is behind us. So Paul pleads for John Mark to be brought to him. He wants to see John Mark. This young man over whom they had this sharp disagreement, now they must welcome him back. It's all forgiven. It's all dealt with under the blood of Christ. So, dear, dear friends, my beloved, my longed for joy in my crown stand firm in the lord my dearly beloved and that's really what we're to do as well well the lord has given us every reason to do it he's given us every confidence that we may do it and he's given us the lord jesus christ and the holy spirit to enable us to do it to live in other words a christian life in the light of our lord's imminent and glorious return well, the hymn we're going to sing is by Margaret Clarkson.